So um, showing that we, we are appreciative of everyone's time here this morning, one on layout, how we plan on moving through the next hour and about hour and a half. So uh, Lisa was kind enough to kick us off on the front end and walk us through how to utilize Zoom so we can all interact with each other today. Um, on the first portion um, of our presentation today, I will be speaking about what the Solar for Vouchers program is all about. Um, from there, I'll hand it off to Pete Lindstrom uh, with CERTS, who will speak about solar for multifamily buildings specifically with the different incentives, case studies, ownership structures, et cetera. And um, then we will have um, colleague um, Barish um, go over the housing choice voucher program. So the voucher specific component of the solar for vouchers program. Um, on the back end of there, uh, we'll talk about next steps for those who do want to enroll in the program. And um, the idea is to really save about the last half hour of this hour and a half um, programming today to hear from you all, because that's honestly the most important part of this for us. Uh, next slide, please. Wonderful. So uh, as I said, my name's Cameron Bailey. Um, I work at the council. I specifically work at the council to provide um, solar, natural resource, and climate resilience planning and technical assistance. Uh, so if you're in the metro and you're looking for any of those sort of technical assistance, you should give me a call. It's my job to answer. Um, then we have Pete over at CERTS for the clean energy resource teams. To really condense our time this presentation, we will here to for refer to clean energy resource teams as CERTS. Um, and then, as I said, Barish, who uh, also works at the council, um, Barish uh, being in the, the research uh, arm of, the, um, of our organization, but really having a robust specialized experience working in housing policy specifically. Um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and move into it. Excellent, thank you. So, goals for the day. Um, we want to familiarize familiarize you with the how, the what, and the why of the Solar for Vouchers program. Uh, we want to introduce you to who all is making this program possible so you have a sense of um, what are our qualifications and experience, what our interests are in running this program, and uh, what value add we bring to the program. Then on the back end, make sure that you understand what the next steps for participation are if you would like to participate. And just want to put out there, um, we noticed in our last workshop, as well as this one, there's a pretty strong contingency of solar developers in attendance, which is wonderful. Really happy to have you here. We just want to make sure you know on the front end that these webinars are specifically for landlords, and we'll have a pre-application webinar uh, this upcoming February that's specifically for solar developers. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, the Solar for Vouchers program, what is it? It's a technical assistance program at, at its core that's designed to help multifamily rental landlords adopt solar energy to reduce their energy costs, right? Uh, landlords can take advantage of these cost savings in exchange for a commitment to rent some of their units to the Housing Choice Voucher, voucher Program participants. So solar technical assistance for cost savings and in exchange place voucher holders at that property. That is really high level simplified idea of the program. Um, now, how that technical assistance structure, what, what, what does that look like? How's that work? So the council, uh, us, facilitates the process of solar panel installation by assembling a committed group of landlords, ideally, which would include some of y'all here today, and connecting them with solar developers who can install solar panels at competitive group prices at high quality. So the Solar for Vouchers program, it offers a simple streamlined process of solar panel installation where program participants can avoid the lengthy process of finding their own developers, soliciting their own bids, trying to evaluate the quality of the work, doing research to identify what to evaluate the quality of their bids against, and negotiating competitive prices um, by themselves. So instead, we would surround you with solar technical, financial, and contractual experts from the council and certs 
to help empower you as landlords in your decision to execute a solar contract or not, and have a really strong sense of why you would or would not at that time. All righty, I think it'll just, yeah, just drop them all out. <laughs> so program benefits, um, keeping it pretty high level here because um, Pete will do us all a great solid and delve a little deeper in some of the costs and incentives, but um, at a high level, there's a potential general five to 15% reduced solar install costs by going through any sort of group procurement program, right? More people buy something at once, think of the Costco model, bulk purchasing. Um, for the electricity savings on the back end, there's generally potential for 10 to 30% reduction in annual electricity costs. So you already know what your electricity cost is at a building, so, you know. <laughs> 10 to 30% reduction of that annually or your potential um, electricity cost savings there. Um, another thing we provide, and this is more getting to the technical support components, are the, the solar technical, contractual, and finance assistance. It's a big reason why we partner with CERTs on this, because uh, CERTs literally provide technical assistance <laughs> for clean energy and energy efficiency. Um, and that is very explicitly my role and job. So we do this day in, day out, year round, and we wanna cater that technical as assistance specifically to multifamily property owners. Um, additionally, gain access to high quality solar installers at competitive prices. Um, so that's um, a process I'll speak to later in terms of how we help bring that about. And then, as I said before, a streamlined, transparent, cohort-based solar install process where you know when the program starts and you know when you're ultimately going to make a decision on when you sign a contract and enroll in the program. We'll flush that out more as we get through this presentation. So why is the council piloting this program? Um, in our last regional plan, Thrive 2040, the council identified sustainability and livability as two of the five pillars of a thriving region. The Solar for Vouchers program serves both of these desired outcomes by advancing the adoption of renewable energy uh, sources and expanding the housing options of low-income residents. Simply put, we want to help you house voucher holders by helping you reduce electricity costs for the next 20 years. Um, it's really what it distills down to. That's what the concentrate tastes like. Uh, next slide, please. Wonderful. Program expectations. So as we said, solar technical assistance, you realize energy cost savings as uh, well as reduced cost of solar install system and greater consumer confidence around what you're ultimately installing at your property. And in exchange, program participants are expected to rent at market rate the following number of units to housing choice voucher holders for a period of five years. So for example, if you have a 56 unit building, we would expect you to place eight section eight voucher holders over a year long period at your property and that you would prioritize eight units at your property for housing choice voucher holders for a period of five years after install of uh, any solar panel system. Um, and we do wanna clarify that we do accept tax credit and section 42 properties, but to fully ensure that you have units eligible to place our voucher holders, we'll connect you with our wonderful housing outreach coordinators, specifically a disease who would normally present here today, uh, but was unable to. And, um, but Ish actually will speak a bit more on what are the constraints and the uh, eligibility criteria and whatnot for the housing voucher component of the program. But did want to state, we do accept tax credit properties, section 42 properties. The best way of finding out if your property is eligible is to reach out to us on the front end to flush that out um, on the front end rather than six months down the line. Next slide, please. Alrighty, so what do you have to do or what characteristics of your property need to be realized to be eligible for this program? So this is a pilot, so we want to help ensure it's successful um, and that what we learn from the pilot is applicable to other regions of the metro and the state. So what we're doing is focusing on 
things that are within our control and purview. So our housing uh, redevelop, our housing choice voucher program or our housing redevelopment authority, we have our own area. And that's the area you see in blue in the metro. So that's a lot of Anoka, Hennepin, Carver, Ramsey counties. Um, your property needs to be in those communities that are in blue. Um, you're not intended to actually be able to read that map because <laughs> those names, those cities are way too small. Uh, the idea is you'd go to the web page when you click on program eligibility and then you can get a document that you can actually read. So you need to be located in our Metro HRA um, service area. The second component is uh, your property needs to be serviced by um, Xcel Energy as your electric utility provider. So um, that'll remove a lot of communities in this map in the northern and further western portion um, of uh, Carver and Anoka counties. But um, you know, just look at your electricity bill for that uh, property in that area, and you'll see if it's served by Xcel Energy or not. And we chose that because Xcel Energy honestly has um, the most financially viable production incentives for solar energy. Um, and they're most familiar with solar energy hookups. So um, to be able to maintain a streamlined program, you need to work with the utility that knows how to streamline and solve solar. Um, buildings, typically we really don't want them taller than five stories. Once you start getting over five stories, you have additional costs and complications that can start coming about on the install. Um, so if you're right around that threshold, it's still worth applying and um, clarifying that, but typically we're gonna say no taller than five stories. And then buildings with five or more units. Um, Pete will touch on why specifically, but when you have five or more units, there's different um, financing options that become available. And there's a certain economy of scale uh, that begins to get realized to really help get in a more ideal payback period um, to get more in that you know, seven to 12 year um, break even point for these systems. And then of course, structurally sound enough to support the install of a solar installation system. Uh, we don't wanna realize any sort of damage to the roof that could have been avoided. So that's a part also of how we're running this program um, where we'll pre-vet your property with you and um, coordinate site installation. So you don't have to know that right now, but I think that is a requirement to move forward in the program. All right, let's keep this moving. All right, so just bear with me here, y'all. We're gonna break this one out slowly. Perfect, thank you. So phase one, one of four, gonna go through four phases here. Actually, I'm gonna take a sip of water. All righty, so in phase one, landlords are expected to attend an educational workshop like the one today about the program. Then if you're still interested, you submit two forms to move forward in the program. The first of which is a property owner agreement, which expresses your interest in participating in the program and sets out the terms and timeline of the program. The second form is a solar site assessment checklist um, for each building you're interested in submitting to the program. So we can pre-vet, pre-evaluate your properties you're interested in participating. Uh, moving into phase two, there we go. Uh, the council will screen and pre-qualify, excuse me, two to three solar developers through a council-run RFQ or request for qualifications process. Our goal in that process is to, is to bring you the most highly qualified solar developers at the most competitive prices. So really trying to find the best balance between those two things, as well as most experience and um, really the, the size class that your multifamily property is. There's different constraints around a 10 unit property relative to a 110 unit property, right? Um, by the way, solar installers are not guaranteed a solar contract with any of the um, landlords or program participants at the end of the program. It's really about bringing both sides together and flushing out if indeed there are matches to be found. And uh, phase three, Property owners will receive technical assistance, which will include some of the following services. So as I think I touched on earlier, um, actually coordinating solar developer site visits for property owners, providing general and site specific contract review coaching with an eye toward contract best practices, um, educating property owners on different solar financing and ownership options to once again, empower them 
um, in this process. And ultimately we do it all to really help property owners, landlords find the contracts that best fit their needs. So identifying what it is you really need to get out of this to consider it a success, and then seeing if we can help match um, the resource of the program to realize that for you. And then bringing it home, phase four, thanks for sticking with me through this slide. Solo developers will extend their final offers to landlords for final decision making. If you decide not to sign a solar contract as a landlord, then you may exit the program at that point without penalty. All righty, and now timeline, because it's all been kind of vague. So first, attend a workshop, learn how the program works, well done. Second, submit your um, participation application by the end of this upcoming January. So really in a few months, which has two parts again, landlord agreement, and site assessment form. Third, we'll then use the group's application forms to inform a request for qualifications process where we'll pre-qualify and select those two to three seller developers to go through the program with. And that'll take place between February and May next year. So really this upcoming spring. Uh, so think of it as um, this winter, we're hibernating and soliciting, identifying collective interest and in the spring, we'll start to cultivate the seeds of identifying those two to three solar developers. And then when we move into the summer, um, we'll be going and actually doing site visits. Um, and we'll help coordinate those between developers and landlord property owners. After that, thank you, um, we'll uh, start moving into our final two phases, which is where certs will really provide a lot of support and helping analyzing and by educating landlords on how to review and negotiate solar contracts. And if you see a contract you like and execute that contract, you can expect to get that solar, those solar panels installed in about the next year. Um, and then lastly, over that same period, one year period of time with solar panel installations, begin to place your voucher holders. So what you ultimately see here is from November 2020 to November 2021, that's about the year long program. Um, and then after 2021, by November, October, November 22, another year after that, that's the transition period where solar panels should get installed. And then over that year long period to start getting those voucher holders placed. And with that, I am very pleased to hand over to Pete Landstrom. Hey, 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 good morning, everybody. Uh, Zoom's telling me my internet is a little unstable, so I'm going to turn off my video, but I wanted to say hello. So uh, I am Peter Lindstrom from CERTS, and uh, here's what I'm going to be chatting about for the next 15 minutes or so. going to talk a little bit about what in the world CERTS is, uh, why, why you should be considering this. Uh, as an apartment um, landlord, uh, apartment owner, why consider solar in the first place? We've got a few tools for you to uh, help make an informed decision. I'm gonna talk about some financing options, some incentives, and then wrap it up with a few case studies. So a little bit about CERTs, or as Cameron mentioned, the clean energy resource teams. We have a a long history, been around for about 15, 20 years or so of working with all sorts of folks, individuals, businesses, local governments, schools, uh, to provide technical assistance for them to make informed decisions around clean energy. And it's a real pleasure to be tag, tag teaming this effort with the Met Council. So why solar? Why solar in the first place? Well, gosh, the cost to install solar has dropped considerably, uh, more than 70% in the last decade. And with tax credits and accelerated depreciation and innovative financing tools, as Cameron mentioned, that, that simple payback is, you know, in the, in the ballpark of eight to 10 years, seven to 12 years or so. 
and uh, understanding that that array is going to be operational for a good two, three decades, the savings can be quite significant. It's a hedge. It's a hedge against utility prices that are unlikely to go down. A conservative estimate is that utility prices are rising at around two and a half percent to three and a half percent annually. So with solar, you're you're procuring or purchasing less energy from the utility. So it's a great way to hedge against those unknown price increases. Got to talk about curb appeal. Uh, there's uh, a lot of folks out there who want to live in a place that matches their own values and they're voting with their feet. Uh, and solar sends a real strong message uh, that this is a company that cares about about uh, their building and, and cares about the planet. And I'll, I'll tell you, thinking about, or, or when uh, preparing for this presentation, I went to plenty of websites with apartments that have solar and uh, it oftentimes was featured prominently as a marketing tool. And just like they're, just like your renters, as a landlord, you, you care about the world we live and uh, across the globe, buildings are one of the biggest emitters of carbon. So when you invest in solar, you're dramatically lowering your own carbon footprint. Uh, the last point here is I put increased property values in parentheses likely. Uh, there hasn't been any studies uh, on what happens to property values of apartments when solar is installed, but there have been studies uh, looking at property values of homes with solar and, and they clearly show that people are willing to pay a premium on homes with solar. Let's talk about some of the decision-making tools and resources. We've got a bunch of them. Uh, we've got uh, tools that uh, um, uh, talk about uh, Solar 101, site selection checklist, if your uh, site is suitable for solar and calculators. It's really about, as Cameron mentioned, that, that technical assistance uh, to help you make an informed decision. So our first tool is Simple Steps to Solar. And it's really uh, just Solar 101. Uh, it's a guide. And it touches on things like uh, your building, uh, site assessment, understanding the local rules around solar, figuring out your budget, and an, a good overview of the installation process. So let's talk about site selection. Uh, some sites are definitely more suitable for solar than others. And if you are considering solar, then we have a great guide uh, here that provides information to consider and assemble and analyze as you begin this journey. A big part of the site selection, of course, is the amount of sun that the site receives. And a, a good rule of thumb is that the site should should be at least 80% unshaded, 80% sunny. Things to consider here include not only the surrounding trees and tall buildings, but also the mechanical equipment on the roof and the walls on the roof edge and, and roof access points, things of that nature. It's amazing, uh, uh, roofs have, they've got a lot going on up there. There could be uh, tie-offs for window washers, vents, satellite dishes, antennas, all sorts of things happening up there. So how do you determine how much sunlight your roof receives? There's an app for that. We got it called the Solar Suitability app. And uh, it's available online. It's pretty simple, very simple. You can just punch in the address of your apartment complex and it'll show you uh, whether or not your site is suitable um, for solar. So let's take a look at um, one specific site. And this is all based on LIDAR data. And you can see in the lower left-hand portion of this site, it says that it has 84% sunshine. That means this is a good site. It's ready to rock and roll. Uh, 
using the the uh, suitability app here, it doesn't take the place of doing a site assessment. And site assessments are are really critical uh, aspects of um, of installing solar, but it just gives you it uh, a good. I guess rule of thumb, uh, a starting point to determine which site is good. Thinking about the site selection or looking back at our site selection checklist, another key component of the site selection is the condition of the roof. And obviously the ideal time to install solar is when you have a, a brand new roof, understanding that that array is gonna be up there for two to three decades. And it is cost prohibitive to, to put up a solar array and, and take it down to, uh, to do any sort of uh, roof replacement. Uh, if, you know, I've found if, you're, if your roof is scheduled to be replaced in the next few years, it's not uncommon to accelerate that replacement and, and put up solar uh, with a new roof. So other things, other big ticket items on our checklist include collecting utility bills and understanding what rate you're on and, and uh, factors to consider if it's a, a ground mounted system. Financing, and, and before I chat about financing options, I wanted to talk about cost a little bit. It's generally, cost is generally measured in dollars per watt. And as Cameron mentioned, there are economies of scale, meaning the larger the array, the lower the cost per watt. And I'd say the range is roughly $2 per watt up to $3.50 or so per watt. Um, so a 10 kW array, you would expect to pay roughly $35,000. Uh, and a 40 kW array, roughly, we'll say $2.25 uh, per, uh, uh, per watt or $90,000. So, um, th and that's all uh, before you factoring in the tax credit, which there is one, uh, and it's a very healthy one. Uh, this year it's 26% federal tax credit. That does drop to 22% next year and then 10% uh, thereafter. And there is accelerated depreciation um, on your federal taxes. And when you purchase a solar array, you can accelerate that, that depreciation over five years. I also wanted to mention uh, uh, a financing tool that's definitely growing in popularity called Property Assessed Clean Energy or PACE financing. It's a loan program for either energy efficiency uh, projects or renewable energy projects where you pay back the loan as an assessment on your property tax bill. The interest rate is really competitive, four and a quarter percent fixed over a 10 year term. That's a typical PACE loan. Uh, and I wanted to mention PACE can be used for, for either existing buildings or brand new construction. Of course, cash is king and, and uh, many developers have uh, partnerships with lenders for, uh, uh, for a loan. And then uh, the last thing I wanted to mention here is what's called a power purchase agreement and businesses and Nonprofits can now install solar arrays with no upfront cost. Uh, you have a third party investor that installs, owns, and operates the solar array. And you as a, a apartment complex owner uh, agree to buy the power from the array at a discount to your current power rate. These, I should note, are typically for larger solar arrays. Let's talk about utility incentives. Um, Cameron mentioned uh, this program is for folks in Excel. 
energy territory and they do have some some uh, healthy incentives because you're producing power, that means they don't have to. Uh, and so they provide some nice incentives for that. Um, two of them, as a matter of fact, one called solar rewards, and that's for uh, for smaller arrays. And then the PV demand credit um, is for larger arrays, larger than 40 kW. I also wanted to note that uh, if two thirds of your residents are low income individuals, then you likely qualify for a bonus incentive from Excel. So if two thirds of your residents are, are low income and there's some measures of, uh, of what that means, uh, then you, you likely qualify for a bonus incentive. And we can help you uh, walk through these various options including we've got some calculators. So uh, we, have, we have two calculators um, and, and these really uh, are tools that allow you to compare proposals in an apples to apples fashion. And we have calculators if you're making a, a cash purchase or utilizing a, a power purchase agreement. Let's talk about uh, some case studies. Um, here's one, uh, the City View Apartments. Uh, it's a 145 kW array commissioned just a few years ago in 2016. It produces 170,000 kilowatt hours per year. And for this apartment complex, that's 25% that's, uh, of the building's electrical load, fairly significant. And since this project was completed, uh, my understanding is at home, um, at home uh, apartments, the, the owners have completed 13 additional solar arrays on their other properties, uh, totaling half a megawatt total. And over the lifetime of these arrays, it's anticipated to save this company approximately $2 million, pretty significant. And for this particular project, uh, City View Apartments, it's estimated to save the company about $750,000 over the lifetime of the array. And I do like this quote from, uh, from the apartment uh, owner. Uh, so um, moving on to the, uh, another case study, uh, I have Liberty Apartments and, and townhomes. Uh, like this quote as well uh, from the from the developer. This is a, a really a decent size array, 452 kilowatt array at Liberty Apartments and Townhomes um, in Golden Valley. It consists of more than 1,400 panels across 55 townhomes, as well as a clubhouse and and five story apartment complex. The energy uh, for this project is it's uh, behind the meter. Um, so it's it's powering uh, the electrical consumption on the site, which which can include uh, things like the swimming pool and, and pumps and lighting, all sorts of things. Total cost was a, a million dollars, uh, or around a million dollars, and it was financed by a mix of cash and property assessed clean energy or PACE finance thing. It's estimated that the solar arrays will, will displace over 5,500 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions over the lifetime of the array. I think that's it from my end of things. And we can move on to the next presenter. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Barushka Mishtaz, and I am a researcher at the Metropolitan Council and one of the co-creators of the Solar for Vouchers program. But today I'm here to talk to you about the Housing Choice Voucher, or what is more popularly known as the Section 8 program. Next slide, please. First order of business, who are we? Uh, what is the Metropolitan Council? 
Metropolitan Council is the regional planning agency for the seven county metropolitan area, which includes Anoka, Carver, Dakota, <clears throat> excuse me, Hennepin, Ramsey, Scott, and Washington country, counties. Metropolitan Council is often known as the agency that takes care of buses and flushes. We, however, do a lot more than that. In addition to operating Metro Transit and running the region's wastewater treatment facilities, the Council's Housing Authority administers the region's largest housing choice voucher program. We also do transportation planning and provide mobility services through Metro Mobility. Next slide, please. Now a little bit more information on the Council's Housing and Redevelopment Authority, or what we refer to as the Metro HRA. As I mentioned, Metro HRA administers the region's largest housing choice voucher program. Metro HRA houses around 7,200 families and 18,000 people each night. The program serves 100 suburban communities throughout Anoka, Carver, suburban Hennepin, and suburban Ramsey counties. We have over 1,900 participating landlords. Please take a look at the areas highlighted in yellow. All communities in the yellow area are within Metro HRA's service area. Next slide, please. Now let's take a look at the program itself. The Section 8 program works as a three-way partnership between the assisted family, the private property owner, and Metro HRA. The property owner has a lease with the tenant. Metro HRA encourages owners to enforce the lease as they would with any other tenant. The tenant has obligations with Metro HRA, which must be followed for continued program participation. And Metro HRA <clears throat> has a contract with the property owner that allows the housing authority to make payments on behalf of the tenant. Section 8 participants are issued what is called a housing choice voucher by Metro HRA. The participant then goes out into the private rental market to find a rental unit in which the property owner is willing to participate in the program. Property owner participation is completely voluntary, but it is very essential to the program's success. Now, let me break down the responsibilities of each of the three involved parties. Next slide, please. First, the program participants. Participants choose a unit and then they pay between 30 to 40% of their income to the property owner. They pay their utilities as agreed in the lease and follow the terms of the lease and program participant obligations. Next slide, please. Second, Metro HRA. Metro HRA pays the balance directly to the property owner with federal dollars. So at the beginning of each month, you would receive that payment from the Metro HRA. It recertifies the family annually and conducts inspections at least every two years. Finally, it enforces program obligations with participants. Next slides, please. Next slide, please. Third, the property owner or the landlord. In this case, you simply collect rent, enforce your lease, and make repairs if needed, just like with any other um, tenant you have. Next slide, please. Now, what are the benefits of the Housing Choice Voucher Program? What are the advantages of participating in the program? First, you deal with smart renters. What do I mean by smart renters? We provide program participants with tenant education. This education involves teaching them about how leases work, how to work with the property owners, and how to be a good neighbor in general. They learn about their roles and responsibilities, and they're trained to be better renters. We also make arrangements for them to receive financial literacy training where they can learn to create budgets and build their wealth. Smart renters are fiscally responsible renters. Second, in case any issues or problems come up, Metro HRA will be there to mediate between you and your tenant. We're here to make your relation with your tenants easier, and we work with both parties to make it happen. And finally, you will have streamlined inspections. Our outreach staff are certified to con conduct housing quality standard inspections. You don't have to request inspection and schedule with anybody. 
they can immediately inspect in person right there and then, or even virtually. Next slide, please. Perhaps most importantly, you'll have a very simple streamlined relation with Metro HRA. The outreach coordinator assigned to this program, Abdiaziz Ibrahim, is the one-stop contact person or liaison between you and your tenants, and he is there to ensure good relations. His job is to strengthen our partnership with you while helping create a great renting experience for both you and our voucher holders. Next slide, please. If you need to get hold of someone at Metro HRA, you simply call, email, or text Abdiaziz. Here's his contact information. As you can see, he even gives you his cell phone number so that you can communicate with him promptly. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions about the Housing Choice Voucher Program, please save it until the Q&A period or simply type it in the chat box and we will get to it during the Q&A. Now I'll return it to my college, Cameron Bailey, and he'll provide you with some more information about the Solar for Voucher Program application process. Thank you. That's true. Many thanks, Badesh and Pete. Um, I will deliver on that. So the um, property owner agreement. First of those two forms I mentioned earlier that really have to be submitted to move through with the program. The components of that agreement are the timeline and the process by which um, we'll be um, rolling out the program. And really we're seeking from you a statement to say, yes, we will prioritize <laughs> our staff time and decision-making process so that everyone can realize this specific year-long timeline and hitting the different milestones in the process. So basically you saying we agree to abide by this timeline and process so it can indeed be streamlined for everyone. Uh, secondary component, which we've hit on a couple times now, are the terms and conditions of um, reserving and prioritizing Section 8 voucher placement at the prop at a property. Um, <clears throat> um, the, number, the number of units that correspond with the number of units in your building. So that little table right there really tells you all you need to know about that placement. Um, of course, if you have questions, let us know. We're here <laughs> um, at any point in time. And that last component talking about who we are as points of contact for the program, we also need your point of contact for the program. That's a part of maintaining a tight timeline and process is um, you letting us know who's, who's the point of contact you want um, and that we should maintain moving through this program. So that's you know just the name, phone number, email address, all the same sort of things we've been providing um, so that we can indeed keep this train on the tracks. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so the solar site assessment forms. And so, as we know, some, some landlords may own, you know, one or two properties and others may have a portfolio of more than 10, right? Um, so what we're asking is for each individual building, you submit one form to the Solar for Vouchers program, which you can find in the top right-hand corner Solar for vouchers at Metsida State Dominion US. That's my name and my phone number. Um, and so, if you're wondering, like, well, what is in these site assessment forms? Um, first off, physical property features. Pete hit on a few of those in terms of like the conditions of the roof and whatnot and what's up there. Um, at a high level, what we are really looking for is where's the building? So, with the address, how many stories is the building? When was, the last, when was the roof last replaced? Um, is it a flat roof or a pitched roof? Uh, what materials cover the rooftop? Is it tar asphalt, pea gravel, tiles, et cetera? And are there any leaks or has there been a history of leaks on the roof? Um, you know, like, do you have a plan in the next few years to replace the roof? Those sort of things. Um, so kind of a, a questionnaire for the physical features of the property. The next component is, um, is the preferred financing and ownership. So uh, Pete brought this up earlier, but you know, are you interested in, or do you actually prefer a certain sort of type of financing? So would you prefer debt financing? Are you more interested in PACE financing? Do you want 
to lease through a power purchase agreement? Um, do you actually want to lease to eventually own the solar panels themselves? Um, and then, you know, as we said earlier, the programs to make sure we're supporting your desired outcomes and needs. So we got to kind of know what those are. So what are your primary points of concern? Is that payback time period and ultimate um, uh, value of the system over the life of the asset? Is it the cost of financing? Is it the long-term operations and maintenance concerns? Um, or perhaps it's roof damage and different insurance liability concerns. So really asking for those to be named on the front end because also maybe those are different for different properties in your portfolio. Um, and we ask that once again, because we use all this information we solicit from you all to run our request for qualifications process to make sure we are indeed best matching the seller developers with um, the properties that landlords are coming to the program with. And then lastly, the housing and utility data. So um, one for eligibility uh, components, um, need to know, you know, like how many units are at your property? Do you already lease to any Section 8 voucher holders? Um, do you, um, oh, provide the, the rental price point at your variant unit sizes. So uh, maybe you only have like efficiency studio, one bedroom units. Well, what are your typical price points for those units? Um, and if you have up to two, three, four bedroom units, like just letting us know and letting us know what is the range of the cost of those units. Um, and if you can, how much a tenant typically pays for utilities. I know we've had some folk interested who like, well, the building's only been up and occupied for four months, so we really don't have that information. You know, provide us whatever you, you have and we can work with that. Um, to parallel that, when we say utility data, we also need to know for you as the landlord yourself, right? So the, those common area um, um, electricity costs, so covering hallway lighting, um, common space air conditioning and heating, if there's an elevator, a laundry room, all those costs that you take on as the landlord, um, we need those utility bills, um, specifically at least one bill from the summer and one bill from the winter, um, so we can get a sense of, um, what electricity charges and use looks like seasonally in Minnesota at your property, and also get a sense of, you know, what are the different potential programs or incentives um, that would make the most sense for your property. And uh, just as a reminder, we as program staff are available to help you find any and all of that information to make sure we, we fully fill out those forms on the front end with our idea really being that it's really worthwhile to spend that time on the front end to identify if this program makes sense for you and makes sense for your property. We'd rather find that out in the first two months <laughs> rather than going through a full year of the program and be like, ah, man, this actually doesn't really work for this property or not right now. Um, so that's really uh, our, our train of thought there. And then advancing forward one more. Beautiful. So congratulations, everyone. You made it. Um, going to ask everyone to try to tap into some of the pointers Lisa gave us on the front end in terms of using that chat box uh, in Zoom. So um, you know, just a reminder, we're specifically looking for feedback from landlords. Um, we'll have a session specifically for solar developers uh, in February. Um, but at this point, asking everyone to use that chat function to share one thing that excites you about this program as you understand it right now and one thing that gives you pause about the program. You're like, not quite sure about that one. I, I don't know if that'll quite work for my property. So if everyone could take, you know, just one or two minutes, use that chat function. One thing that excites you about the program, one thing gives you pause about the program. Um, and, you know, if there's a couple of you who may have watched this and realized this program isn't for you right now, um, but you'd still want to participate in the future, could you let us know what was the sticking point or the thing that wouldn't enable you to participate in this program? Great, folk are really quick on the uptake here. <laughs>
For those of you who can see our faces, you can see that Cameron and I, every time you're adding something, we're like, oh yeah, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, you know, keep it coming. I, I just wanna re-emphasize something that Cameron said at the beginning, which is that this is a pilot <laughs> and, and the intent is to use this as a learning experience to then say, okay, so were we to do it again, were we to expand it, what would we need to incorporate? So Cam, maybe we'll touch on that when we get to that Q&A, but it might be nice to just reemphasize that a little bit. Totally, totally. Thanks, Lisa. And um, Lisa, but just before we head into open q and I just wanted to let everyone know that we have uh, another one of our HRA, Housing Redevelopment Authority coordinators here from the council, Renee Pereira Webb. Um, so we, we have <laughs> uh, HRA coordinator, the sort of person who would be working with any and all landlords interested in participating in the program to help answer any of those kind of sort of logistical or eligibility questions about the, the housing voucher component of the program. So thanks for being here, Renee. No problem. I see a couple of questions in there. I'll be certain to address when we get to the Q&A as well. Great. Cameron, I thought I would just put up the website real quick, like. Are we ready to stop screen sharing, do we think? And we can just go back into the Q&A part. I'll stop sharing.
So it looks like we, we have a handful of questions uh, that we can use to get started. And I don't know, I mean, Renee, you were just saying, I saw a couple in there. Um, do you maybe wanna kick us off? And, and of course, folks who put questions in, you know, feel free to also just, you know, unmute yourself and add additional detail. But Renee, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to get started. Sure, the first one I see in here is from MTK. Uh, you would ask if the applicants or future residents are provided from the Metro wait list or the landlord, and that would be our, our same process. It would be through our wait list. That's one of our requirements that we have at the HRA, that people have to come through the wait list. So that is how they would be referred for the program. And that would be based on bedroom size and that of the units available through this program with the vouchers. Hopefully that answered that. And I did see one other down here that um, spoke to utility allowances. And I'm guessing that you have worked with the program. At this point, this is a, a, a pilot and those utility allowances are set forth by uh, the Department of um, Housing and Urban Development. So at this point, it wouldn't affect them. I'm thinking uh, what we would be doing is looking at the overall um, data after the program and possibly raising a case for it to actually be changed for uh, buildings that have the solar program in place. Um, but great question. And um, we're excited to see where this will go with that. But at this time, it would still be the same utility reimbursement and um, utility costs. Super, thank you so much. Um, Cameron, there, I mean, there are a couple of questions about the, you know, the utility territory. There are a couple of questions about particular jurisdictions. Maybe you want to speak to that just a little bit more. Yeah, sure, totally. Um, and I think you teed that up really well, uh, Lissa, in terms of this being a pilot. And so um, we, we would love for this to be at the very least metro region wide, seven county metro region wide, and ideally even statewide. Um, but that's absolutely why we're also running yeah, a pilot and running the pilot within the constraints of the things that are really within our purview. So our service territory from a housing redevelopment authority perspective uh, is primarily um, Hennepin County, Anoka, Carver County. And so um, ideally we run this program. It's successful in the sense that um, we get feedback from landlords. We find what does, doesn't work for them, what were sticking points as well as for solar developers, as well as from a housing, um, housing redevelopment authority perspective. So we can take those lessons learned and feed those up to a larger metro scale. Um, I, I think MHFA would make the most sense to coordinate this at a, at a metro-wide region or a statewide region, but also like we got to get them some data points. So I know, yeah, Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, St. Louis Park, Adina have all expressed interest in this program as well. Um, so, you know, like maybe a, a pilot next year is um, coordinating with the other HRAs and cities who say like, we do want to do this program. And maybe that makes an easier transition to roll this program up from a pilot at one sub-regional level to a full region to maybe a, a full statewide level. Um, and with Excel Energy, you know, a pilot, you want to be successful. So looking at which utility get, puts us in the best position as like for landlords, for program admin, from a housing and technical assistance perspective, it really is working with XL Energy. That utility has the most experience with solar development on any type of property and building. They have the best solar production incentives. So um, that's probably where we're going to see the best payback periods for your properties is in the Excel Energy Service Territory. So similar, similar to one, you see this program scale. And as Renee spoke to really um, in, in a really innovative manner is like asking like, okay, if there's sticking points, what can we do within our purview at a state agency level? I think similarly for electric utilities, as Pete spoke to, there already are specific conditions for properties primarily serving low-income properties, but that's just Excel Energy. So um, ideally, the, these are making recommendations to be applicable to other electric utilities so that any city, any county, any HRA, and any electric utility is an ideal um, context within which to run this sort of program. 
Patrick, were you wanting to add something? I saw your video pop up. No, I was just going to, I was going to ask what kind of uh, outreach you guys have done. Uh, hey, Cameron. Hey, everyone. I recognize a lot of faces and names on here. Um, I was just wondering what kind of outreach you've done with the solar uh, contractors and developers, you know, in, in the incentive programs that we run, we find that solar providers and contractors are, uh, do some of the best outreach far better than we can do uh, with these programs. So just curious what kind of outreach you've done there. Yeah, on the solar developer side, um, I'd say it's more so, you know, like I've been at the SIA conference the last few years and spoke to this as a program that was in development um, with SIA um, be because they have a, a clear, uh, a clearly stated code of conduct. Um, also have promoted it through their network that the program exists. And honestly, a lot of solar developers have been reaching out, asking about the program, when the RFQ process will launch. So, um, oh yeah, sorry, acronyms. Thank you, uh, Alyssa. <laughs> SIA, Solar Energy Industries Association and the Minnesota specific chapter. Uh, so solar developers who work in Minnesota. Um, and so, um, at this point, because we're really focused on property owners, um, once we kind of wrap this month on recruitment and outreach to property owners, then we can start transitioning into a much harder recruitment um, and promotion with solar developers to make sure we do get a robust pool of high quality solar developers and bids at really competitive prices. Mm -hmm. Super. Um, let's hit on a couple of Jamie's questions here. Um, Jamie, you say, ah, did you say that Section 42 properties are eligible? I swear at that first meeting, we said that maybe they weren't. Okay, so it's a pilot, right? Um, so Barisha, you responded to this in the in the chat. It's a learning experience as we go, but do, do one of you want to speak more to what you have gleaned about this particular issue? And then it looks like there are a couple other questions from Jamie, but let's start with that one. I can surely take that one. Um, we are actually accepting applications from Section 42 and also LIHTC um, buildings. Uh, we just want to make sure that, you know, usually the rents that are charged in those buildings are within our payment standards. Um, so they are compatible. It makes it easier for both parties to place voucher holders. In terms of having um, units in your building, if you say, um, if um, the program participation say requires that you place four voucher holders in your property and say you already have three, um, that doesn't mean that those three units are contributing toward the four. You have to place four additional voucher holders in your property in addition to the three you have. So we're um, expecting that there will be more units, newer units um, to be able to qualify for the program. And there's another question about whether or not um, if the uh, unit is not affordable for the prospective tenant, if they have to find a, um, a family that can afford the gross rent, uh, we will basically, our outreach coordinators will be working with you on the front end to see by taking your rents at, by bedroom and your um, utility allowances and your zip code, we know exactly how much we can pay as the Section 8 program. So from the get-go, we will know if your um, units are affordable and that makes you uh, eligible for the program. And uh, so um, if we cannot find a family that can afford the gross rent, uh, we will definitely look for others to fill the unit. And this, if despite all efforts, we cannot find um, tenants uh, who can afford the gross rent, then the option is um, either that on our end, because we're dealing with HUD regulations, we cannot reduce or increase the rent. Um, we expect you to reduce the rent to match the pay payment standards. Otherwise, we will screen your property from the get-go to see if you have affordable units, and we will help you to fill those units um, from the beginning. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's super. And and Barisha, I think you touched on both Jamie's questions and Allison's questions. But Jamie and Allison, can you just give me a quick like did that <laughs> did that cover what you were asking? I just want to confirm before we go to another. 
And Lisa, I want to just add that I've been answering them in the chats too. I see so that. I know that, I'm watching so. you. It's, it's awesome. Okay. Janie says, yes, we got it. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, and then, and Renee, you also responded to to a question from Henry about HAP contracts. And I have no idea what that stands for, but that's okay. But Henry, are you feeling like you got that question? You're good? Okay. Uh, yes, okay, well done. Every, you guys are all just, just so on it. Okay, and Allison, thank you. You do have a lot of voucher holders. Okay, okay, so this, yes, it would be an addition. All right. Um, uh, okay, let's hit Megan's question because I can see it here and then I'm going to scroll back up because I know there are a bunch of roof questions. Um, but that, yes, I'm going to bring up a point in Allison's answer and I'm going to throw this back to Cam. This is where mm -hmm. I don't come in. She has contracts for project based vouchers. That's what the BVV is, which is different than our Section 8 um, HCV. Um, has there been discussion about that, Cameron? I just don't want to leave that hanging there if not. Yeah, Budish um, feel perfectly free to step in here as well, because um, we've we've had a lot of conversations <laughs> about that. Yeah, Budish, you, I feel like you, you spoke with um, Terry, our um, HRA director, most recently about this. Um, uh, what what was your impression? Um, I guess I'm just I want to make sure that um, your contracts are with PBV units and. Those are your existing contracts anyway. If we're talking about moving forward with new um, units, that should not be relevant. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. What you have right now is not an issue from our point of view because you will be uh, placing new unit holders. I'm not quite sure if <clears throat> those units will also be PBB units. Yeah, that's what I wanted to make sure if they were, um, that answers it. Okay, thanks, Allison. I just well done, Allison. Good questions. I mean, you're just putting people through their paces. I like it. Okay. It. Um, okay, let's get to the Davis Bacon. Where did that question go? There was, okay, here it is um, from Megan. Are there any Davis Bacon requirements based on the number of housing choice vouchers? And Davis Bacon are like prevailing wage um, sorry, <laughs> that's what that's referring to. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Yeah, no, we have this conversation and we're, we're not putting any council dollars into the solar side of things for, from the solar developer side of things that is not a requirement in terms of prevailing wages. Um, we initially thought about going down that path and then we remembered this is a pilot um, so it was either a six year long development process or a two year long one. So we opted for the two. Um, so no, from the solar developer side, there's, there's no prevailing wages requirements. Um, Renee, I'd ask you though, did, does that ever show up for the housing choice voucher side of things in terms of like, I don't know, like subcontractors or anything at the property? Not that I'm aware of for a housing choice voucher program because everything, I'm going to say no at this point with a leeway of, I could be 1% wrong, but I'm 99% sure it's a no. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so back to this topic, the, <laughs> um, the PBV. Henry asked another clarifying question about if the site is already 100% PBV, does that mean that the site would not qualify for the program? I will chime in to say, I am not positive. We can get back to you on that. But if Renee has a, uh, a take on it, I would just uh, bounce it to her basically. But it's something we can certainly find out and get back to you. Yeah. I would want, since I haven't specifically asked this question, I would definitely want to get 100% um, clear. Um, just so you guys, people that don't know, PBV stands for Project Based Voucher. That means that the housing assistance is actually tied to the unit, whereas in a housing choice voucher, the assistance is tied to the tenant. So that's what we're talking about. There's different rules 
for these two programs. So I just want to explain that in case there's some people that don't understand the two acronyms. So that's why it's unclear because there's different rules for the program. So what I would like to say is let us check on this and get back to you, Henry, um, to, to be sure. I don't want to give you um, any information that's not 100% correct. Super. Okay, so we're gonna stick with this train again. So the H, so Megan says, will there be an HAP contract or how will the units be designated to be filled with Housing Choice Vouchers recipients? The answer is yes, there will be a HAP contract. Mm -hmm. You would let us know what um, units are going to be um, selected for this. Uh, we'd need to know bedroom size and I don't, Barish, you might have to help on this. I don't know if there's a, a certain bedroom size um, requirement or not, but once we know those, we would then fill those um, with people that are appropriate for the affordability and offer that. And then we go through our regular process, which would be, you know, the rest request for tenant, uh, request for tenancy approval, and then the inspection, and then the lease, and then the HAP contract. So it would still be the same process flow chart wise. Hopefully that answers that for you. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Megan for letting me know. Okay, um, so let's go back to a few questions from earlier. So there was one earlier um, from Allison about our agency doesn't pay federal taxes. So we would need to understand better if there is less of a benefit to us. And Pete, maybe I can sort of toss this one to you and maybe to Cameron to talk a little bit about how the PPA might work in that sort of, sorry, the power purchase agreement might work in that sort of setting. Sure, happy to take a crack at that one. So uh, PPAs were really set up for entities that do not pay federal taxes, uh, such as local governments, schools, nonprofits. Um, so uh, PPAs, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, the developer or the third party, um, these are often called third party solar. So that third party owns and <clears throat> owns the array, maintains the array, puts the array on top of your complex for no upfront cost. And then you pay the uh, a set rate um, typically for uh, 20 years or so is the uh, lifetime of the contract. And that, that, that rate may be, um, it's on a KWH kilowatt hour um, rate and it might be eight cents, nine cents, 10 cents, something like that per kilowatt hour. There are options to, um, uh, uh, assume ownership of the array, uh, typically in year six or seven. Uh, and um, so that's an option as well. And it does really, I think, make it accessible for these larger systems. So remember Pete also referenced in his presentation that is less common probably for smaller systems, but for a larger system, that is the sort of thing that makes it accessible and makes it accessible in that financing realm to get to that kind of payback um, that you might wanna see. Um, okay, uh, there are a few different questions here. We're gonna go in some different directions. One is, have there been discussions with cities about tree requirements? And is that related? So Megan, is that related to like cutting cutting down trees? Tree to maybe help us out there, say a tiny bit more. And you're welcome to unmute yourselves. I know you're all fast typers, but you know. Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah. So like some of our properties are on really tight sites and the number of trees that are required over time could potentially block the solar potential. So that's, I mean, on many of our sites, if they're tight sites, the trees that are there have to be cut down to build the building, but over time, they will block the sun, potentially. Yeah, that's a great one, Megan. And the first city I had that conversation with was Shorewood in the West Metro, um, because they have a robust tree ordinance and uh, about a third of their trees were slotted to be lost to the Emerald Ash Borer. And so they're thinking, how should we replace these trees? And we were having conversations about solar 
It's like, should we plant trees that are really genetically designed to not grow taller than like 20 feet tall? Because that's more or less the roof line of a two story building, which is really typical of like, like small, medium sized commercial properties. So <clears throat> solar industry, I've, I've never told anyone to cut down a tree to install a rooftop solar PV system. Um, there's other mechanisms in place to realize solar savings there. I didn't want to say community solar garden because that's not where we're focused on today. So if that's an issue, that's why we have site assessment forms um, to figure that out, get those screenshots, get a layout. Um, it may be a thing that those trees aren't going to block out your system for 25, 30 years. So also getting a sense of like what species of trees are those, uh, their projected growth rates. Um, so yeah, great example of why we do site specific checklist forms to have that conversation. It may make more sense for that property to do instead of a, a typical state building code required setback from the roof line to maybe triple that to account for the projected uh, shadowing effect in the future. I love that you brought up such a really like tan, like solar and trees. I always tell people in solar presentations, the number one rule of solar is that trees grow um, so that you need to think about that as you go forward. All right, so um, a number of good questions here about roofs and structural integrity of those roofs. So, um, oh, sorry, one of them just disappeared, but I think there was a question in here about, okay, so we'll need to do some conversations internally about the timing of roof replacements. Pete, you did reference this a little bit in your presentation, but maybe speak a little bit more to the like, if you're planning to replace your roof in X period of time, this is why you might wanna think about replacing it or some things to think about with regard to that replacement. Well, you may have a capital improvement plan for your property and and uh, uh, as I as I mentioned, if you're if it's part of that plan to replace your roof in the in the next year, two or three, uh, think about accelerating that um, uh, to to match up with with placing the solar. Put the roof on, then procure the solar. And especially if you're thinking about in within the next 10 years needing to do something, that's that's really not probably a great alignment then. Um, I mean, speaking from personal experience, we on my home, we redid our roof. We knew we were going to have to in the next six, eight years. And since we were going to go solar, we decided to just take care of it right then and there. So. Yeah, and listen, that's that is one of the questions and the um, site assessment form is when was your rooftop last replaced? When are you planning on replacing it again, if you have a plan? Okay, there was a question earlier about low income. Sorry, Pete, were you going to say something? Nope. Okay, low income tax credits. Where is that? Okay, from Megan, this was earlier. The need to understand and spend some time understanding how it might impact the low income housing tax credit. Is that what that, the, yeah, okay. Cam, what do you say? Mm -hmm. uh, I could say, but um, I feel like Barish should uh, try that one first. Uh, if you have a low income housing tax credit property, you should definitely be eligible for this program. So um, that should not constitute a, a barrier at all. Yeah, and I think my question was just related to I just need to look at the financials a little bit to understand how it impacts um, the financials, I guess. Um, I guess I do not know enough about how the financial part of the low income housing tax credit works to be able to respond to your question. No, uh, but if a question, it was more of a comment, just like I need to look at it. So, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. And with all things, um, you know, really running those numbers matters. I mean, Pete mentioned that we're doing, you know, some, we have some calculators that will help you think about on the solar side. And of course, these things then interface with all of the other things that you're thinking about. One of the things that I'll just briefly mention about the calculators is there are ways that you can then say, like, I, I want to I wanna look at a different escalator. I want to think about, you know, 
what my cost of capital is. I think there are going to be different ways for you to all think about that. And you are probably far more savvy on, on some of those economic pieces about your own economic situation, right? And we kind of get the solar part. So then you're going to have to layer those things together. Um, other, other questions? Um, I'm trying to scan. I'm sorry if I missed something. I'm really trying to, to get all of them here. Cameron, on the low income, uh, the solar rewards program, these properties would qualify for this program and that program, right? I know Pete had mentioned um, the Excel solar, low income solar rewards program is a dollar a watt for the, for the smaller-ish 40 kW systems. And that's a lot of money. That's $40,000 on a 40 kW system upfront, right? When you, plus you get all the other solar rewards and then you could combine that with this program, right? Yeah, well, this program, because uh, we're not putting any incentive money into that, you know, it's really helping bringing together all existing resources. So from how we're administering this program, there's nothing we're doing that would prevent any and all of those um, different incentives from being stacked and aggregated. Similarly, you know, if we were expanding this program in Minneapolis, um, you know, the different green zone initiatives um, incentives would be absolutely eligible to stack on as well. Thanks, Patrick. Um, okay, there's some questions. I think a good one here about just structural soundness. Um, I and MTK. I mean, I think this. I think it will have to do the the in the site visit, they will actually look at some of the drawings specifically to understand load characteristics, structural integrity of those facilities, but it will be really a partnership between the property owner and the solar developer to be looking at those things and making sure that everybody feels confident about the structural soundness of the roof. I don't know, Cameron or Pete, if you want to add any more on that. Um. I have some thoughts on that, but um, Pete, would you want to give that a, a first go? Well, my understanding is for these projects, they need to get a PE sign off um, as, far as, as part of the process. But that's very common, typical. Uh, Cameron? Yeah, just because the size and scale of these properties, most solar developers will have their kind of go-to um, PEs are professional engineers, so state licensed and certified civil structural engineers um, to review the layout and construction and materials um, of your rooftop, your rafter system, yada, yada, yada. What year was built, what standards it was built to, the year it was built. Um, so that's just the, yeah. So that, that'll be the vast majority of these properties because we're not doing small single family residential. Mm -hmm. And MTK, I'll just note that some of the things that you're already articulating are exactly the sorts of things that, you know, Cameron is referencing, right? So like, when was it built? When was the remodel? All of that kind of stuff. So that'll be really helpful. Um, okay, other questions. Pete just put in a link to the Excel low income program so people can take a look at what that looks like. I'm not seeing anything come through. It looks like, you know, we have a few things that we will follow up on, <laughs> um, a few a few points of clarification, and that is part of this learning process. Um, to just reiterate to everyone, um, the program website is really your one-stop shop, and any of the humans who you've heard from today would be happy to field <laughs> your calls and questions. Um, and that really is a big part of this process, right? Is if you have things that you wanna just talk through, or if you're ready to sort of throw, you know, throw your hat in there and say, hey, we're, we'd like to participate, then we start that review process. And if we have questions, we'll follow up, right? That, as Cameron mentioned, we would rather find out in the first two months whether or not this is a good fit for you than find out, you know, sometime next year. So we wanna do that. We will be sending out a survey, an evaluation survey via email 
it is very helpful for us to get your feedback, both about the session, but also just other questions that you might have. And that's a great opportunity to, to let us know. We have recorded this session. We will be making the recording available um, to, to everyone on the website, but we will also email things out to all of you. And there's an ongoing frequently asked questions document, an FAQ that addresses many of the questions that you've had. And we've been making updates to it. Um, as you all ask really good questions, um, we've been adding and building out that resource. So that's available. Um, Cameron, Barish, what else might you add to help close us out? Uh, I'd say if you're remotely interested in the program, just give us a call. <laughs> you know, I left the, our, the email there, my name, my phone number, <laughs> and um, we're, we're all available. So if you're just remotely interested in the program, just go ahead and give us a call, talk through it, clarify it. So, you know, it's like if this program isn't a good fit for you, another goal of this program is to put you in touch with other programs and resources that already exist. So maybe it looks like you do a reservation project. Uh, maybe that's solar install. Maybe that's an updated boiler um, with some sort of utility rebate. So we are here as technical advisors and um, providers of technical assistance to the region and the state. Um, so we can't help you if you don't reach out to us. So please just give us a shout and um, see how we can help you. And many thanks to everyone for your time this morning. Yeah. Thanks for your time, everyone. Have a great day.